you've studied iron. So iron is not generally viewed as being something that is an aging concern. Um, and in fact, and you, you wrote a paper on it recently, which was interesting. And we, we went through that uh, on the channel. So uh, can you, so what led you to seeing iron as a problem in particular? Um, well, you know, it, it, oddly enough, um, I've been interested in this topic for a long time when long ago um, I, I read an article uh, about the, the uh, late Dr. Jerome Sullivan. He was a physician uh, and back in, I think this would have been the, the early 80s maybe, he came up with the idea that, gee, you know, um, premenopausal women have far lower rates of heart disease than men of the same age. Why is that? Everybody up until then had thought it was hormones, something to do with estrogen or, or something like that. And he said, well, it's because they have low iron or that was his hypothesis. And he went on to write many, many articles, scientific articles about this idea, the iron hypothesis. There were many other scientists um, that uh, basically chimed in and, and got involved in this. Luca Maschitelli, uh, Leo Zukarski, um, and, and many others, uh, Francesco Facchini. So I read these things and later on, I returned to it after reading long ago about Jerome Sullivan. And later on, I returned to it in the course of writing articles for my website. And I just dived in. It was so fascinating to me. I've, I've written a few books. And then I, so I decided, well, I, I guess I need to write a book about this. So I did. It's called Dumping Iron and it's available on Amazon. So that was five years ago um, that, that I published that book. And, um, you know, then I basically turned my attention to other things. More recently, I had been reading uh, more about it because there are new articles coming out all the time. There's new research coming out all the time about iron and health and disease. So I was reading more of the recent research and, and dive back into some of the older things. And, and I thought, you know, this is, this is just being in my, in my opinion, the whole field is being neglected. There's something here that is staring people in the face um, and I feel that scientists and doctors should be paying more attention to it. And so I wrote that article. It's well known that iron plays a role in many diseases, for example, cancer, uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's it's the, the role of iron in cancer, for example, is just so patently obvious. Um, cancer cells, for example, it's, it's probably, it's fairly well known uh, by people who have more than a passing interest in the, in the topic of, of cancer that cancer cells use glucose. They're hungry for glucose. They, they take up a lot of glucose to, to grow and use for energy. And therefore, one of the ways they do this is they have a lot of insulin receptors on their, on tumor cells, right? So they have cancer cells have far more insulin receptors than normal cells do so that they, they can make use of all the glucose and basically, basically suck it up for their own use. What's less well known is they have a lot of transferrin receptors. So transferrin is a receptor or is the protein in, uh, in the blood that carries iron. Uh, and so they have a large number of transferrin receptors. They're, they are hungry for iron. Iron is a growth factor. Um, it, is, it is absolutely required for all life. It's required for growth. Um, so they suck up the iron. And then in contrast, iron chelators, which are chemicals, drugs, or natural products that bind iron and remove it, um, fight cancer. This is, this is there's, there's tons of research on this. So just looking at that one topic alone of cancer, iron plays, iron plays a large role. Now, like, for example, the role in heart disease has been more controversial, um, where there, there have been findings that have gone, let's say, either way. 
Um, and there's been a lot of debate about why this is and so on. Um, but neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease is well known for an accumulation of iron in the brain. Um, iron generates free radicals, the hydroxyl radical, and destroys molecular units, um, it creates, uh, uh, wreaks molecular damage. So that's well known. Iron chelators are proposed to be, um, to be effective in Parkinson's disease. I'm not sure how far that's gone in, in a clinical sense. Phlebotomy has been proposed for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and again, I don't know if anyone has actually tried that clinically, but, um, but this has been discussed. So iron is everywhere you look. And in terms of aging, it's also, it's also very important. So for example, calorie restriction. Calorie restriction is the most robust, dependable, life-extending intervention known. This has been, and, and this has been known for nearly a hundred years, actually longer if you count anecdotal evidence. But, uh, and, and at the time when this was discovered, this was a surprise. Um, like you could take lab rats and feed them a whole lot less than they want to eat and they lived a lot longer. So, so ever since then, there's been a lot of research trying to figure out why this is, um, how the molecular mechanisms and so on. And one of the, one of the things that happens in calorie restriction is animals accumulate less iron if they are calorie restricted. So this has been seen in uh, many animals um, from, you know, from yeast to, you know, C. elegans and all the way up to, you know, lab rats and so on. So they accumulate less iron with calorie restriction. So you could say that, you know, the question there is, um, is that a cause or an effect? Um, there, there have been many attempts to explain why calorie restriction extends lifespan. Does it because it lowers insulin, for example, or decreases adiposity or, or um, you know, a number of other things. Um, but one of the things it does is decreases iron accumulation. And of course, all these things that calorie restriction does are not mutually exclusive. Um, but what is perhaps of more interest is that withholding iron from some of these organisms extends their lifespan. So for example, uh, in C. elegans and in Drosophila, the fruit fly, blocking iron absorption increases their lifespan. So this seems to me pretty solid evidence that there's a cause and effect going on here with iron. So one, one thing is I do know that, uh, so we, we talked to a person who delivers uh, TPE, uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. So they are using that. Uh, there was a trial for that with Alzheimer's. So it's, right. I mean, it's not phlebotomy, it's not removing blood, but it, it is related to lowering iron, I believe, among other things. I, mean, that would, I don't know whether. Right. So one of the things I, I discussed in my, in my paper was, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure you, you know about these, um, the, basically uh, plasma exchange experiments, uh, heterochronic parabiosis, um, where two, an, two animals, two lab rats, for example, of different ages have their, share their circulations. They're stitched together and they share their circulations. And they, they found that there's a rejuvenating effect on the older animal from, from this. And at first it was thought um, that there were rejuvenating factors in the blood of the younger animal that were causing, causing this effect. Then they figured out that really the effect on the younger animal in terms of, of, Ill, of Ill effects on the younger animal were bad. They, they, were, they were, in other words, it, it was worse for the young animal than it was good for the older animal. So there you, there you start to think, okay, well, there's something in the old blood that's doing this. And the reason why uh, the older animals become rejuvenated is because their, their, old, their old blood is being diluted by the younger blood. So 
the group of the convoys, uh, uh, Arena Convoy has published a lot on this. Um, they've done a lot of these experiments. Um, so in, in a recent paper, they found that what they called a neutral, uh, an age neutral blood exchange by uh, also rejuvenated older animals. In other words, they would take these older animals, they would remove half of their plasma and replace it with saline and albumin. And they found that this was uh, rejuvenating for, the, for these animals. So this is obviously in this case, in this particular case anyway, this obviously there are no, no rejuvenating factors from young animals being put into this into the circulation of the old animals and merely taking something out and replacing it. So they also found that plasma from human beings who had undergone therapeutic plasma exchange had a rejuvenating effect on mm -hmm. uh, muscle cells. This is, you know, shown in the lab. Um, and so what is it? Something is removed from the blood of, of people who undergo therapeutic plasma exchange that results in a rejuvenating effect. So what is it? Well, I, I hypothesize that it's iron. Um, people who undergo therapeutic plasma exchange have a high rate of iron deficiency anemia. Um, one study showed that 60% of, of the patients they looked at developed iron deficiency anemia. And um, you have to have low iron and D to, to develop anemia from it. And they found that 100% of the patients experienced a drop in, in serum iron in ferritin levels. So I, it, it, this, this all points to iron as being the pro-aging factor that is removed from the plasma of these animals and that has this rejuvenating effect.